streams in the desert. You know, it's nice when I can take a different approach and come recording the devotionals and devotionals in the cool of the day because it's always a balance between starting your day and finishing your day with God in the beginning, with God in the middle, and with God in the end. And you know, isn't that the way that it ought to be, that we should spend our day meditating, thinking, spending a relationship, talking, conversing, and enjoying not only each other's company, but God himself. Isn't that really what God did in the garden when he walked in the cool of the day with Adam? Isn't that in reality what Jesus said he did as he sought his father in the evening or in the morning long before dawn and saw what his father was doing and conversed with him for his day? Isn't it what Jesus said he would and his father would do with us if we would open the door and he would come and spend time with us? Isn't that what it says in the book of Revelation? <laughs> I think so. So, having a personal relationship isn't just simply about having faith about it, but it's having a knowledge of it. It's being, in reality, knowing that God is here in our midst, that God is here in my heart, that God is right now speaking to me and to you, and we are participating in conversation with him. Isn't that... A living God? Isn't that just like our God? In streams in the desert, what I do now, thou knowest not. Thou shalt know hereafter, though, in John 13, 7. We have only a partial view here of God's dealings, his half-completed, half-developed plan. But all will stand out in fair and graceful proportions in the great finished temple of eternity. Go, in the reign of Israel's greatest king, to the heights of Lebanon. See that noble cedar, the pride of its compeers, an old wrestler with northern blasts? Summer loves to smile upon it. Night spangles its feathery foliage with dewdrops. The birds nestle on its branches. The weary pilgrim or wandering shepherd repose under its shadows from the midday heat or from the furious storm. But all at once it is marked out to fail, to fall. The aged denizen of the forest is doomed to succumb to the woodman's stroke. As we see the axe making its first gnash on the gnarled trunk, then the noble limbs stripped off their branches, and at last the tree of God, as it was the distinctive epitaph, coming with a crash to the ground, we exclaim against the wanton destruction. Why? Why would someone be destroyed such in such a way? The demolition of this proud pillar in the temple of nature. We are tempted to cry with the prophet, as if inviting the sympathy of every lowlier stem, invoking inanimate things to resent the affront. Howl, fir tree, for the cedar has fallen. But wait a little. Follow that gigantic trunk as the workmen of Hiram, Hiram launch it down the mountainside, thence conveyed in rafts along the blue waters of the Mediterranean. And last of all, behold, it set a glorious polished beam in the temple of God. As you see its destination, placed in the very holy of holies, in the diadem of the great king, say, can you grudge that crown of Lebanon was despoiled in order that this jewel might have so noble a setting? The cedar stood as a stately prop in nature's sanctuary, but the glory of the latter house was greater than the glory of the former. How many of our souls are like these cedars of old? God's axes of trial have stripped and bared them, and cause such pain and anguish when we thought we were at such a success. We see no reason for the dealing so dark and mysterious, but he has a noble end and object in view, to set them as everlasting pillars and rafters in his heavenly Zion, to make them a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of our God. You know, oftentimes people don't recognize the reason why God does certain things, and sometimes they say, well, we'll figure it out in the sweet by and by. And the reality is that's not what God says to do. He says that if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who abradeth not, but give it to all men liberally, that we literally could ask God why. You can ask God, what is your purpose? And God may not be specific to exactly answer to your satisfaction what his purpose is because it'll always be greater than what you could comprehend but we can know by the promises that he's given us 
that he has a design in mind, that he has purposed within his heart a specific reason and direction for which we are going to know why something has happened in our life and that it will be accomplishing a greater design and purpose in his will than anything we would ever have imagined if we were left to our own will to do. So all we need to do really is trust in the Lord with all our heart. And when we find ourselves in those circumstances, to not doubt, to not fear, because God isn't just near, He's in us, He's with us, and He will work through us day by day as we walk with Him every day.